One of the more popular food supplements among bodybuilders and athletes in recent years has been in a category called pro-hormones. Uh, pro-hormones are basically, can also be called testosterone boosters. These are various supplements derived from various sources that are thought to increase testosterone. Uh, the obvious attraction is, uh, you know, anabolic steroids are synthetic versions of testosterone. And, and uh, of course, everyone realizes you don't have to be a scientist to know that anabolic steroids beef up muscle tissue. So the idea is that by taking a uh, pro-hormone, you're, you're almost, it's almost close to taking anabolic steroids. And a lot of the people that favor these supplements uh, don't really want to jump on the anabolic steroid bandwagon just yet, but they want a, a, a way of increasing the testosterone. Uh, a lot of this population are older men who are age 40 or over. Uh, at, at that age, your testosterone production starts to decline. And a lot of men want a little bit of a boost to uh, keep their testosterone within a certain range because unless your testosterone is within a certain range, it's extremely difficult to build m any kind of muscle mass. So if you go to the gym and your testosterone is really low, you're, it's like hitting your head against the wall. You're not going to make any gains. You're going to get increased injuries and so forth. So that's basically the, uh, the uh, mechanism of why people want to use pro-hormones. Now, pro-hormones, uh, you know, a lot of people look at the history of pro-hormones and they think that uh, uh, in the late 90s there was a substance called androstenedione which was introduced into the commercial market and uh, this was basically a precursor to testosterone and uh, a lot of people refer to and androstenedione as the first pro-hormone but that isn't really true <clears throat> the uh, first uh, pro-hormone, let me back step a little bit uh, as far as the current state of pro-hormones uh, Pro-hormones evolved starting with androstenedione. They c kind of, you know, as, as research came out and they became more and more popular, various people involved in the industries tried to find new sources of pro-hormones and everything ranging from herbal sources to straight chemicals. And uh, like I say, each generation of pro-hormones evolved starting in the late 90s all the way up to around, let's say, the uh, 2012 or 13 or so. The last generation of pro-hormones is the one that really was most effective, and there was a good reason for that. The last generation of pro-hormones were actual anabolic steroids. These were old steroids that were developed by pharmaceutical companies in the early 60s, but they were never released for commercial use, uh, and they were discarded, kind of left on the shelf, because the initial animal toxicity tests showed a lot of toxicity associated with these uh, steroids. And, uh, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies didn't want to get involved in litigation, so they kind of never released them. But the formulas for these early st uh, steroids were all gathered in, in books, such as uh, this one called Anabolic Steroids by a guy named Julius Vida. And this particular book had all the structures of these early steroids. And a lot of these uh, purveyors of pro-hormones got a hold of this book and other sources, and they basically resurrected the old steroids brought them back to the market and called them pro-hormones. Unfortunately, there was a good reason why these pro-hormones, if you want to call them that, were never released because they were toxic. And, and soon, sure enough, within a short time after these uh, pro-hormones, which were actually anabolic steroids, were released onto the market, the medical journal started uh, publishing a bunch of case histories about bodybuilding athletes who had, uh, for example, severe liver defects, a couple of them had liver, liver failure, kidney problems. These were all related to these uh, so-called pro-hormones, which were actually anabolic steroids. So what this led to was the passage of the 2014 Designer Steroid Control Act, which was signed by Obama, which basically banned all the, uh, the anabolic steroid-based uh, pro-hormones and even had clauses in there that would, would, would prevent the development of new pro-hormones that actually boosted testosterone. Uh, so, you know, that, that basically ended the era of pro-hormones. Now, there are still, of course, pro-hormones on the market. Now, the interesting thing is most of the current pro-hormones on the market, or a large percent of them, are based on the only legally available pro-hormone. What is that? Well, it, coincidentally, the only available legally pro-hormone happens to be the very first pro-hormone ever introduced onto the market. And it wasn't androstenedione. What it was was dehydroepiandrostenedione, 
uh, I'm sorry, dehydro, dehydroepiesterol, it's hard to pronounce, let's call it just DHEA, DHEA. DHEA was um, actually introduced in the late 70s, and uh, it didn't get a lot of fanfare, you know, the, I mean, uh, it didn't get the publicity, there wasn't a lot of studies out back then about it, but what happened was, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the uh, companies selling the uh, DHA and the uh, let's say the first version of DHA they would derive from a substance called Mexican wild yam specifically a sterile not a steroid a sterile a sterile basically is a plant form of cholesterol and uh, if, in the lab sterols can be turned into steroids but only if you have the enzymes to to convert to do that conversion those enzymes don't exist in the body but to make a long story short the uh, DHA, uh, the uh, companies that were selling DHA decided to use a shortcut, and instead of actually selling actual DHEA, they were selling disogenin, which is the sterile derived from uh, wild yams that can be converted into DHA. Unfortunately, the human body lacks the enzymes to do so. So basically, people were buying wild yam extract that was masquerading as DHEA. Eventually, the FDA got the attention of the FDA, and DHA was removed from the market in 1985. Not so much because of any side effects, but mainly because it was fake. Most of it was just fake, and it, it was a fraud. However, there was another law passed, the 1994 uh, Dietary Supplement Act, which basically decreed that the onus of toxicity was transferred from people selling supplements to the FDA. In other words, uh, to remove a product from the market, the federal government, in, in the form of the FDA or Food and Drug Administration, had to prove that a supplement was toxic. Because of this, and because DHA is a natural sub, uh, substance, uh, it, it, uh, DHA came back on the market, and this time it really was actual DHEA. But, but this law also opened the door to a bunch of other so-called pro-hormones. And the, the, again, the, the law said that if the substance was found in food or in nature, it was allowable for sale. So this opened the door to a whole bunch of early pro-hormones, most of whom, I should add, did not work. They either had a slight effect on increasing testosterone, not enough to be significant, or even worse, some of them, like androstenio, tend, tended to increase estrogen more than testosterone when taken in larger doses, like 300 milligrams. But let's talk today, let's focus on DHEA. And, the re and there's a good reason for that because what I said earlier, most of the current pro-hormones that are on the market are actually structured for, uh, structurally changed forms of DHEA. That's why they're legal. They're basically slightly changed forms of DHEA. An example of this is one called 1-DHEA. One 1-DHEA one is converted through two enzymatic steps into a pro-hormone that was actually banned back in 2004 called 1-testosterone, which is actually pretty potent. Now, sooner or later, the government, I don't know what, why they're dragging their feet, because this particular steroid, if it truly does convert into 1-testosterone, and I'm not sure that it does, but if it does, that would mean it's in violation of the 2014 Designer Steroid Act, and it is illegal. So I don't know how long this stuff will be on the market. Uh, I have seen one or two studies, uh, and, it, and it has shown to be, unfortunately, toxic. Uh, there was a study of young men published in an endocrinology journal which showed that 1-DHA was in fact toxic. It's, 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 no, it's not a good stuff to take, not good. But let's talk about uh, DHEA. DHEA is the major steroid hormone secreted by the adrenal glands and it circulates in two forms. Mm -hmm. There's free DHEA, but free, free DHEA similarly to growth hormone only lasts about 20 minutes before it's broken down. Now, what happens is, though, when you take oral DHEA, it gets in the liver, and it, it travels to the liver, I should say, and it undergoes a process called conjugation, which, which means that a sulfate group is attached to it. So it now becomes DHEA-S. This is the form that circulates in the blood. This is the form of DHEA that is tested for when you go to have your DHEA level tested. They look at DHEA-S. Why? Because DHEA-S lasts 10 hours or more in the blood. It's not broken down. It circulates in the blood. DHA has long been thought to be kind of like a, a mother steroid hormone in the sense that it acts as a precursor for the production of 
of other uh, steroids such as testosterone and estrogen, uh, what happens is there's just some enzymatic conversions can convert DHA uh, into, androste uh, into androstendio first, and then it can go into a pathway where it becomes either testosterone or estrogen. Uh, so, uh, by the way, DHA was discovered way back in 1934, coincidentally, by one of the same scientists that discovered testosterone in the same year. And so, you know, DHA has been around a long time. DHA is one of the main precursors for the, uh, as I said, for the precursor of, of sex hormones. Also, when older people take DHEA, it increases their levels of insulin-like growth factor 1. Insulin-like growth factor 1 helps maintain connective tissue, muscle tissue, other tissues in the body. And because of this, DHA in the 90s, a couple of medical journals came out, basically giving the, uh, uh, presenting the idea that DHA was a kind of a fountain of youth hormone, and a bunch of people started taking it in the hopes of kind of turning back the clock. Uh, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, but the problem with that is that DHA can take different pathways, and it's hard to predict which pathway it can take. For example, one study of young men involved in weight training who took DHA found that DHA did not become testosterone. Was it, not? It, was, it wasn't converted into testosterone, but it was converted into a DHT metabolite. DHT is dehydrotestosterone, which is a metabolite of testosterone. Uh, a lot of the side effects associated with testosterone are actually caused by DHT, such as acne, male pattern baldness, and possibly prostatic enlargement or enlargement of the prostate gland. So you know, it's not good to have a lot of DHT, but the thing is the DHT uh, derivative derived from uh, uh, DHA in young men, nobody really knows what it did it because the men didn't show any side effects. But they, it's kind of like a, a red flag because it is a form of DHT. They don't really know the long-term effects of it. Uh, in, in some older men that are low in, DH, uh, in, uh, tes in uh, testosterone, DHT does turn into testosterone. But in other men, it, turn, it, go, it takes the estrogen pathway. So the real problem with DHG is you never know which direction it's going to go in. But some recent studies found some interesting effects of DHA that were never known. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But uh, as I said, it, you know, it, it started out as a, uh, you know, as a fountain of youth uh, type of thing. And uh, it was said to you know, have an anti-aging effect, anti-obesity, anti-cancer effects, uh, and uh, uh, as far as body fat goes, there was a study done of young men who took a massive dose, 1,600 milligrams a day of DHEA. That's huge, huge amount. And uh, they, sure enough, they, they, they showed a 31% drop in body fat. Unfortunately, this study was never replicated. Uh, the animal studies also showed, when they give DHEA to rats, it also shows a dramatic loss of body fat. But again, when you give when when you give uh, doses of DHA to humans, it doesn't seem to cause much loss of body fat at all. Uh, there is another form I'll talk about in a second called seven keto DHA, which is a metabolite of DHA, which may actually cause a slight loss of body fat. I'll talk about that in a in a minute. Uh, now DHA also one good thing about DHA that is established is that it has anti-catabolic effects. Uh, in other words, it basically counteracts the effects of cortisol. Cortisol is another adrenal hormone that causes the breakdown of muscle and causes catabolic effects. DHA opposes the actions of cortisol both in the body, in the immune system, and even in the brain. Because a buildup of cortisol in the brain, uh, which is due to stress, actually tremendously ages the brain, particularly the portion of the brain called the hippocampus, where the, the, which is the seat of thought, thought to be the seat of memory and learning. So in, in a way, you could say DHA does protect the brain. Uh, now, uh, DHA is a, it's also a, what they call a neurosteroid, meaning that it acts in the brain. It has several actions in the brain. It can, uh, it has, uh, it, it can produce euphoria. It, it, uh, it reduces anxiety. And it, it also uh, uh, has a pretty good effect at, at lowering depression, especially in older people. One thing that a lot of people don't realize about DHA in the brain, though, however, is it inhibits uh, a, a neurotransmitter called GABA, which is GABA aminobutyric acid. Now, the, what's the significance of that? GABA is uh, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It helps you relax. It's very important for helping you to sleep. Now, what, what the point being 
is if you ever take DHA, never take it before you want to go to sleep because it'll block GABA and you'll get a tremendous case of insomnia. I, I've never seen that written anywhere, but it is a fact. Uh, uh, okay, the, the, I'm looking at There was a study here. Let's talk about, um, about the conversion into testosterone. Uh, there was a study, and I'm just going to read it right off here. Uh, the effect of DHA on serum testosterone and adoptions to resistance training in young men. In 10 young men, the inge ingestion of 50 milligrams of DHA increased serum androstenedione concentration 150% within 60 minutes, but did not affect serum testosterone and estrogen. This is in young men. An additional 19 men who participated in an eight-week whole-body resistance training program and ingested 150 milligrams a day of, of DHA or a placebo showed, uh, showed in significantly increased concentrations of androstenedione. Uh, but serum concentrations of free and total testosterone, estrone, estradiol, estriol, lipids, and liver transaminates were unaffected. In other words, uh, it, it, it raised uh, levels of, of androstenedione in young men, but it did not raise concentrations of either testosterone or estrogen. Uh, they concluded the study by saying, these results suggest that DHA ingestion does not enhance serum testosterone concentrations or adaptations associated with resistance training in young men. Now, what I said earlier, it, it could be a little bit different in older men, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. But I just want to mention briefly about 7-keto DHA, which again is a metabolite of DHA. It does not, now, 7-keto DHA, unlike DHA, does not convert into testosterone or estrogen. What it does is, it does, however, have the immune boosting effects of, of DHEA. It also ha uh, supplies a minor thermogenic effect, meaning it helps convert fat into heat. And in this way, it might help you lose a little bit of body fat. It also seems to have a beneficial effect on thyroid metabolism, keeping your thyroid metabolism at a normal level. Uh, that's kind of an iffy proposition. Some studies show it does. Some studies show it doesn't. Uh, now, uh, I wanted to talk about this uh, study about uh, uh, the study of older men, I, I, I mentioned earlier that DHA might have a different effect in older men. And the reason I say that is because some very recent studies found a very strange effect that was, very, that was not known at all. It started out in animals. They did some studies in animals. They, they, uh, they gave uh, DHA to the animals. Uh, now, I should mention, DH, let's get back to this DHT, dehydrotestosterone. Dehydrotestosterone is actually five times more potent than testosterone alone at interacting with androgen receptors. In fact, a lot of your most popular anabolic steroids are DHT-based because they're, they're pretty potent, and, and DHT-based steroids do not convert into estrogen, which is a good feature. That means no water retention. However, you might say, well, why don't I just take DHT alone? Well, you want that to give me bigger muscles? No, because DHT produced in the body is degraded by enzymes in muscle before it can have any anabolic effect in muscle. So taking a straight DHT is not going to cause any muscle gains. However, it turns out that these animal studies show a, pre a previously unknown enzyme exists in muscle, which actually can convert circulating DHEA into DHT in muscle. Now, it, now th th this showed up initially in animal studies. They weren't sure whether it would also exist in human studies, but then they did some initial studies in first in, in, in human women and then in men, and sure enough, they, they gave DHA to men that were showing low testosterone levels. And, and uh, by the way, this enzyme, uh, I should point out a very important point, it's only activated when you exercise. It's, it's been shown to be activated by aerobic exercise, and they think it's also activated by resistance exercise like weight training. But at this point, they're not sure if weight training activates it, but they know that aerobic exercise activates the enzyme. And this enzyme, again, will convert DHEA into DHT in muscle. Once in the muscle, DH, DHT has a very potent anabolic effect. In fact, one study where they gave older men, men maybe 50 years old, they had them engaged in a weight training and aerobic program. They gave them DHEA. And, sure, and, and these men were, 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 uh, were tested and shown to be low in testosterone. When they provided DHEA and, they, and, they, and the men engaged in exercise, they showed 
Be believe it or not, they they showed no problems with testosterone. In other words, it, it, they didn't even need to take testosterone. Their, their, their testosterone actually normalized. Now, I want to point out, it's very important to note, these are preliminary studies. I know it's not written in stone, and I'm not saying that DHEA can substitute for testosterone in older men. What I'm just saying is that it, it's interesting. The most interesting thing about this to me is the fact that there is an enzyme in muscle that apparently does exist in humans, which can actually convert DHA into DHT. And, and I, as I said, DHT is even more potent than testosterone itself. If you could boost DHT in muscle, uh, I imagine that men involved in weight training would have a pretty good effect. Now, what about the dosages of DHEA? The usual dosages are, it depends. I mean, uh, there's some people that have taken fairly low dosages and for some reason had a little bit of heart rhythm disturbances. Uh, I have never met anyone who've ha had this. I've, uh, I've taken DHEA myself now for probably 10 years because I did a lab test about a decade ago. It showed that I was actually below the normal scale of DHEA. And that's what I recommend. I recommend that before you consider taking DHEA, you have a, you go to blood test for DHEA S. And if you're in the low, if you're below normal, that you it would be a good indicate, uh, especially if you're involved in weight training and you're over 40, that would be a good reason to take DHEA. And like I say, it does have some good uh, neurosteroid effects. Um, it def it seems to decrease depression. Also, if uh, any of you ever take finasteride to, uh, let's say, block male pattern uh, uh, baldness. Some people have side effects from finasteride. A lot of these side effects are due to uh, depression that's brought on by using finasteride. Well, it turns out DHA in, uh, actually increases in the brain some of the same neurosteroids that are blocked by finasteride, such as allopregnenolone. So the, it could be that DHA is a partial antidote to some of the side effects of finasteride. Again, there's been no studies. It's just a theory of mine. I've written this up in my Applied Metabolic Newsletter. Uh, and, but uh, as far as actual doses of DHA, uh, I would recommend, uh, like I say, you could start out at about 25 milligram. I myself, I take 25 milligram twice a day, so I take a total of 50 milligrams a day. You could take up to 100 milligrams a day safely. However, uh, with 100 milligrams, you're getting a little iffy territory. If you take like the larger doses of 100 milligrams, it might start to take a pathway into estrogen or something like that, which you want to be careful. So I think basically as a replacement dosage, 25 milligrams twice a day or 50 milligrams total is a good dosage of DHEA. As far as side effects, uh, I haven't had any side effects whatsoever. Uh, I have met, uh, I should also point out in women, unlike men, in women, DHEA, this is an important point, DHA always converts into testosterone in women, always. Unfortunately, in some women, it causes some of the side effects associated with increased testosterone, such as a lowered HDL and possibly adverse cardiovascular effects. But more, more, more importantly, I, I'd estimate that half of women who, who I've known who have taken about 50 milligrams a day of DHA have got acne, pretty bad cases of acne. And that, that's to be expected in some ways because... The uh, the uh, the acne that teenagers get, that's you know the acne that's common in teenagers, is actually caused by a surge of DHEA in the teenage years, which stimulates the increased secretion of sebum, which is an oil produced uh, in, in the hair follicles, where bacteria act upon the oil and produce acne, and that's how acne is caused. But that but DHEA is what stimulates the oil and eventually causes acne. So you know if you're a woman. You might want to, you know, if you want a little bit of a testosterone boost, you, uh, I'm not going to say that it's going to help you lose body fat or do anything else. Uh, it might increase your sex drive a little bit because testosterone controls sex drive in both sexes. You might want to try a little, you know, start out with about 25 milligrams of DHEA and see how it works for you. And that's about it for DHEA. Uh, and like I say, uh, almost all, I'd say 98% of your current pro-hormones other than DHA itself, are actually DHA analogs. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, they, uh, if they do convert into one testosterone, they're not safe, no matter what any of the ads, no matter what any of the sellers tell you. And if you want further information about nutrition, hormonal therapy, exercise science, fat loss techniques that work, ergogenic aids, uh, 
every aspect of nutrition exercise you can possibly imagine, all in depth, 40 to 50 pages every month. Subscribe today to my Applied Metabolics newsletter, www.appliedmetabolics.com. Best information anywhere, better information than anything on the, on the web, including blogs, including uh, various websites, better than any of the information you'll find in the magazines. I incorporate my 55 years of study and, and training experience into every newsletter. I absolutely guarantee no matter what your level of education, you will learn something new in every issue of my newsletter. Again, www.appliedmetabolics.com. If, if you want to have the best friend you'll ever have, go to your local shelter, adopt a dog. Any breed, any dog, they're the best, they're the greatest. Take care.